All right, let's see what is up. All right, looks like we're live now. So thank you. I assume you can hear me. Can someone message me in the chat and make sure everything's uh, good to go? Um, so one thing I can do here tonight is I can overlay comments like this one. Eh, eh, pretty slick. So what we'll do as we go, if I see anything that's like really contextual to the presentation as we go through it, um, I'll overlay it. And then when we get to the end where we have Q&A, um, I'll definitely overlay the ones that I'm going to um, talk through. So, so yeah. So obviously I haven't done a live stream since the Morning Brush Back podcast, which was back, I guess, last year. Um, but I'm excited to be back to doing this. So thanks for being here. If you're here with me, um, just making sure everything's up to snuff, checking out my YouTube app. And make sure I can see myself. It looks like we're okay. All right. Okay, so let's get going. Um, all right, perfect. Thank you, guys. Um, so what we're going to cover today, as the you know title suggests, uh, we'll talk about pitching velocity. Uh, we'll talk about injuries. I'm not going to go too into depth, like into the weeds about specific like mechanical stuff, but feel free to ask me that at the end, uh, the FAQ section. I left a lot of stuff more general because I really want to reach more of the parents and developing players in generalities rather than get again too specific where it excludes some people. But the first thing I want to say, um, number one is thank you. So obviously 20,000 subscribers is a lot. Um, I don't focus a lot on subscriber count. That's not like, you know, it's not like that big a deal, but I'll tell you what it does mean. Number one, it's flattering. I appreciate you all watching. Number two, um, you know, as a creator, it sucks when like you make a video, you put a lot of time into it and like seven people watch it. Right. And that's the reality for everyone when they start out, if you're a non-celebrity, which obviously I'm still not a celebrity. And so I've gotten to the point recently, and this is part uh, because of all of you and part because of good feedback and part because of the YouTube got, tube algorithm and all these different factors. But because you all watch my videos and share them and all this stuff, you know, any video I make now gets a thousand, two thousand views. And that feels good in the sense that it's not a wasted effort if I go into the weeds about something or, you know, I've done some videos about jamming hitters and stuff that's like pretty technical and nuanced about holding runners and, and pitching mechanics and all those things that I think are really interesting about baseball. And I really do appreciate your comments, um, you know, when people say, hey, like this is helping me understand the game, even if I'm not a player. I've gotten a lot of non-players who say, like, I didn't play and I don't play now, but, um, you know, I really I'm learning a lot about holding runners and just random stuff as they just watch games on TV. And I think that's cool. So I appreciate that. And again, I, I want to make the content both that you want to watch but also stuff that's meaningful to me. And I think we have a good balance right now. And I appreciate that. And again, a lot the thanks goes to you for allowing me to do that. So things in the works, these are just quick announcements, stuff that I'm excited about. So number one, um, if you've ever read these like Dear Abby columns where someone writes like, hey, Dear Abby, like I have a raccoon problem. What should I do to get him off my porch? Um, you know, she'll say, well, maybe you should put some traps out. Uh, I am making a column on my website. It's up there now. So you could submit a question today. Um, for parents, we're athletes. So if you have a question that you think would be really general for everyone else, like, hey, my son's 14. When should he start the recruiting process? Um, I like elaborating and I want to get back to writing a little bit more. Um, and then some some of these questions will end up as YouTube videos for sure. So I'll link to this in the description. Um, I'm not sure it's there yet, but it's also on, on the homepage of my website. So if you see the tab there, it says Dear Dan, you can easily go and do that. Um, number two, I'm working on a new online course for baseball. I actually have more for softball than I do for baseball right now, but I'm working on a routine course. So it'll have like uh, flexibility, mobility routine, arm care routine, uh, sprints. It'll have a full sprint and agility program in it, throwing routine, um, lots and lots of stuff. So things that people can use, follow step by step with obviously with a video for everything that I think a lot of coaches, especially this is more so built for coaches than for players. Um, if you really want, hey, I need I need stuff for my kids to do in pregame, that's going to be really productive and high level, but still simple. That's kind of what I'm working on. That's one of my my projects. But the big project that I've been working on that I'm really excited about is my third book. And I've got the copy that I've been editing out of right now, and it's going to be called Clean Your Cleats. 
and it's a book on advice. This is uh, the second draft of the cover art. Sorry, I know it's a little blurry at the moment. Eh, where are we at? So we're still working through the cover art, um, but we like where we're getting at at the moment. Um, but yeah, this is a book. I'll share a little of the table contents. It's a book on basically if I had a, a, a son or a little brother and I wanted to lay out everything that I think he should know to really make it in baseball and to, you know all the lessons I learned, that's what I put in this book. So I'm really passionate about this project. Um, it's been obviously on the back, not on the back burner, just, you know, it's been a sort of a secret works. Um, but I'm now to the point where I'm done the to the second draft. I'm recording the audiobook in my closet, which um, I'll show you this photo right here. It's kind of like a fort. It's pretty funny. Uh, so I have these big acoustic panels um, and then I have this uh, soundproof blanket. It's not like a regular blanket. It's actually like a like built for acoustic quality blanket that I hang on top. And that boxes me in to my little studio right here. Um, so I'm about 10 chapters done uh, recording it, which there's still a long way to go. Um, but I'm hopeful, hopeful that the book will be done and released um, no later than February. And it really could be a lot sooner than that because I'm moving through it pretty quick. But I'm excited about that. Again, it'll be called Clean Your Cleats. So look for that in the future. Um, so let's get to it. So first thing on the docket today is velocity. Um, and I want to talk about just some of the general things that you need to know. And I, again, fact versus fiction was part of the title today. And I want to clear up some misconceptions. And one of the things I had on Twitter today, um, yeah, this guy's not bad, huh? Jacob DeGrom, I'm just throwing 100 mile per hour darts um, on the black of the plate. He's incredible. But velocity is really misunderstood. And I know it, it causes so much anxiety and consternation for people. I had the same thing in college. Every one, you're just wondering, how can I throw harder? How can I throw harder? How can I throw harder? How do I not lose my velocity? And then, of course, how do I stay healthy? So first, let's get started by talking about velocity by age. This is a chart that I made, and this is going to be a full YouTube video on its own. It's just been a little bit down the queue. Um, but I think this is important to understand. And this is what I want to talk about first is, is age, like how it evolves over the years and what you should expect out of yourself. So by age eight to 11, I really don't think you should care. And I know most parents don't. And that's great. Um, when you get to 12, 13, 14, it's still you still shouldn't care too much, to be quite honest. And one of the big things is this chart is just general. So if you look at this, this is formulaic. You know, every essentially it's about four miles per hour per year. And I broke this into different groupings. So I get my handy dandy pointer here. So right here you know, low range, mid range, high range. And here's the thing. If this is Southern California, this is going to be different than if it's like rural Idaho and no offense to Idaho. I'm sure there's some great players that have come out of Idaho, um, you know, great potatoes, all that good stuff. Five guys, French fries. Uh, any, anyway, this is going to change incredibly. I mean, uh, one of the examples that I use is there's a Cal, you know, Lucas Giolito and Max Freed, um, both, well, I don't know if G leaders in the playoffs now, but I, I watched Max Freed pitch the other night. They went to the same high school. These kids were both first round draft picks. So out of the same Los Angeles high school. So you could be the best pitcher in an entire state and be the third best pitcher on that one high school team in, in LA. So understand that this is highly dependent on where you live um, and all that. No, I'm actually, I'm actually in Washington, D.C., um, I actually almost didn't make this live stream today because I had dinner with a friend, took a bike home, should have been 15 minutes, took a trail, got lost, 15 minutes became an hour. Um, so I got more exercise than I bargained for today. Um, but I'm in Washington, D.C. I used to live in Illinois. That was my where my baseball academy was. Um, so with these thing, with, with these age, these brackets of velocity, what I want you to understand is it's really easy to start comparing yourself on YouTube or on Instagram or wherever on Twitter, PBR, whatever, you know, a perfect game and say, Oh man, I'm 15. Here's a 15 year old. If there's 91, see this word outlier here, that's an outlier. If you throw above 85 in high school, you're still an outlier, like an incredible outlier. You're an incredible talent. If you can throw 85, I threw 80 as a high school senior, I could touch an 83, like once in a while. So just understand that, velocity, even though there's, it's more normal to throw 90 than it's ever been in the history of humankind, it is still absolutely not normal to throw 90 miles per hour. It's a really big accomplishment. And it's really hard to do that. So uh, I don't want to get stuck on this, this slide too long, but I want to show you that this is my next big point with velocity and these brackets. If you're a 14 year old, 
or let's take a look. I'm, I'm assuming these kids are probably 12. This kid's 12. He weighs 82 pounds. This kid's 12. He weighs probably 145 pounds. They're both 12. So when you look at this same chart, okay, my son is 14. Is he the size of a 14-year-old or is my son the size of a 17-year-old? I had a kid in my baseball academy years ago who was uh, 14 and a half through 85 to 88 miles per hour. I take no credit for him. He was six foot five, 225 pounds. So when you start talking about this kid, I, uh, Austin, who went off to play D1 football, he was essentially a 17 or 18 year old in a 14 year old's body. So when you're saying, why does my 14 year old only throw 65, but another 14 year old throws 85, a lot of the times it's just because they're in a different body as you know, their, their developmental age is different than their biological age, essentially. So just like this photo here, which is a great example, this kid might throw 70 miles per hour. This kid might throw 58. Who's better at baseball? This kid might have better mechanics, but this kid's so much bigger and stronger because he's physically more developed by that age through no advantage, not no fault, not no fault through his own, but he didn't do that, right? You don't choose your genetics. So it's really hard, I think, for players and parents to wait and say, well, yeah, this kid maybe needs to really get his velocity up to stay competitive, but you can't really outrun your genetics. And that's, I think, a big thing to understand as parents and players. Are you better? Are the kids on your team better than you? Or are they just physically more developed? And that honestly is most of the time the bigger reason that players um, throw harder on one team versus the other. It's rare that you have a, a 15U team, for example, where every kid is 5'9 and 150 pounds. If that was the case, then you could say, OK, this kid throws harder because his, his mechanics are better. This kid throws harder because his, he's more explosive. This kid throws harder because he does this or whatever. But it's really not an, a level playing field in any sense until about college. Even in high school, you have 15 year old, you have 18 year olds who are 160 pounds versus 18 year olds who are who look, you know, I mean, look at a D1 football game. These are 19 year old kids who look like grown men. So understand that as a parent, as a player, Ask yourself this question, where, how old am I biologically? Like what's your actual age is, and how old am I developmentally? Like, do I look like a 17 year old in a 15's body or do I look like an 11 year old in a 12 year old's body? You know, it goes both ways and don't despair when you're not throwing as hard as you want to, you can't outrun your genetics. So, you know, obviously when you're busy, bigger and more physical, you're going to throw and hit harder. Um, but this is also evidence for weight training. And I know most of you are probably already bought into weight training, so I don't need to preach too much. But, you know, if if you realize that this kid throws so much harder right here on the left because he's so much bigger. Well, if you can add some of that weight in the weight room, that's going to help, you know, level the playing field to a degree. So weight training is really valuable. And I'll talk more about that towards the end. But the thing with being small and I've had this conversation and it's heartbreaking and it's really difficult is what can I do? You know, if I'm still small, I'm still waiting for that growth spurt. You have to just do the best you can. And, and really that's all you can do. You can do your best, but you can't like weighted balls aren't a shortcut. Strength training is not a shortcut. They'll help, but you're going to have to wait until you grow. And that's, um, it's just one of those extra fun life lessons that baseball and other sports teach you. You know, again, like I said, everyone catches up in high school or college and in, pro, in, in, in the pros, no one throws harder than anyone else because they're just more developed. It's, it's because, Hey, I either worked harder than you, or I'm just genetically better than you or my mechanics or whatever, a lot of innate factors. So we'll come back to that a little bit in a little bit, but number two, and this is a big one um, because beyond weighted balls and uh, weight training. And I hope you asked me a weighted ball question later in the FAQ. So put your, put your thinking caps on. Um, but does long toss increase velocity? And really, I don't think it does. And I want you to think of it this way. What is the mechanism through which long toss would increase your velocity? Because really, it's just throwing at a maximal effort. So it's not really different than throwing in the bullpen. You're throwing at a different angle. Now, there's a lot of benefits to long toss. Uh, I believe in long toss. I believe it teaches you to go uphill with your shoulders. I think it teaches you to shift your weight well. I think it teaches you to use your front side. So I think uh, long toss is like a mechanical tool where it's almost like doing a drill more than it's actually like an exercise for yourself because without you know here's here's the analogy in the weight room if you lifted the same 100 pound barbell every day for five years would you get stronger it would get easier but you'd plateau because it wouldn't be a new stimulus for your body when you're long tossing you're throwing the same ball 
as hard as you can, but it's still the same ball. It's still the same same uh, same stimulus. So it's not really going to give your body that stimulus to grow and to adapt and to change. That's something like weighted balls. And I'm not here to advocate for weighted balls. That's not like my point here. My point is that this doesn't fall in the line with other modes of physical training. This is just like if you're to sprint as hard as fast as you could, would you really expect to get faster except for just getting like more in better condition? Not really. You get faster at sprinting by improving your sprint technique, by getting your legs stronger and more explosive, which is typically done in the weight room. Obviously, sprinting is an important part of that, just like throwing is an important part. But long toss in itself isn't really like a strength building thing. It's something that's good for your arm. You have to throw if you want to throw hard. But, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not that big of a deal. So understand that long toss is just another tool. But, yeah. Um, what's up, Mr. Tatis Acuna Jr.? Yeah, you're late, but you didn't miss a whole lot. So we're talking about velocity. We're going to cover um, a couple of things more here in a second. But talked a little bit about biological age versus developmental age. And this is what I want to go back to, and we'll, we'll visit this slide again. So when we talked about here, which is how hard do most players throw by age, um, you know, how much do players gain? And this is where, again, if you come away with anything tonight, uh, I want you to come away with, like, better, more realistic expectations. You know, how, how fast should you expect to gain velocity? And, you know, I owned a baseball academy for nine years, and what I'll tell you is this is about the number. This is about the range over time three to four miles per hour per year. That doesn't seem, if that doesn't strike you as a lot, it's because it's not. That's one mile per hour per financial quarter, right? So every three months, one mile per hour or so. So let's go through some scenarios about how that looks like in practice and how that sort of shakes out. So here's my first example. Here's a good player. So when I say good player, like they're uh, genetically, they have uh, some explosiveness. They're a good athlete. They're a good baseball player. They have good mechanics, et cetera. And this player is a hard worker. So this would be like a typical kid who's really committed to baseball. He's a good player. He comes into his academy, whatever. He, he consistently does strength training, arm care, works on his mechanics, all that stuff over a long period of time. So he starts out throwing 60 miles per hour at age 12. He adds four miles per hour per year. That's going to be our benchmark because he's got good genetics. Like he's explosive. He's got some, some, some raw ability to work with. And he's a hard worker. So he's going to get the top end of this range here, that three to four miles per hour times six years, 12 to 18, he's going to add 24 miles per hour and end up at 84 as a high school senior. And again, 84, I know to a lot of you, isn't an aspirational number, but that's, that's, that's hard for a developing kid. Now, is that going to get you in a D1 program? Maybe not. But again, most of you watching and most of your kids are not going to go D1. It's a really, really high bar to clear. So this is a, a really realistic expectation if you throw 60 at age 12, you're right in the middle of the pack. You're good. Um, you can expect to probably get to the mid 80s at some point if you're really diligent and hardworking and really are a student of your craft. So now, so you have like stellar genetics, like you're one of the premium athletes in your in your sort of draft class. Like you're a really, really good athlete. You've got a lot of explosiveness, a lot of natural ability. Let's say you're on the, a little bit above this range, right? A little bit of an outlier. So you're going to gain five miles per hour on average per year over that six year period. You're the kid that's going to go from 60 and end up throwing 90 his senior year. And you're probably going to have a D1 offer if you can throw strikes, throw a second pitch, et cetera, et cetera. So, again, that's a realistic long term expectation. 60 to 90 over six years is realistic. Here's a good player who doesn't work that hard. Right? he's going to get the low end three miles per hour per year over that um, six year period. That's going to be 18 miles per hour. He's going to turn in throwing 78 at age 18 and he's going to either go to a junior college or going to be, maybe just not, you know, if he's lazy, maybe not playing college at all, but 78 is going to put him in that borderline where you, you certainly can find a place to play. If you can pitch a little bit throwing 78, I've sent many kids off uh, to college programs, usually junior colleges or D threes throwing that speed. There really is a place for everyone, by the way. Um, but you know, again, he's at the low end of that three to four miles per hour. So over his six years, that's where he ends up. And of course, then we have a player who doesn't have as much na natural raw physical abilities, not as explosive, not as good of an athlete, but he's a really hard worker. So he's going to do his best, but two and a half miles per hour per year is all he's going to get. So that's going to give him 12 miles per hour. Um, and, uh, well, I did the math wrong, but this math is right. Two and a half times six, uh, is 15 miles per hour. And that's going to put him in at 75. Um, ben, your question is, so if I throw 80 at 14, will I still have that same gain? That's a great question. So like 
here's my next slide. Let me answer that with a little cheap diagram. This is not a linear thing. And this is what I really want you to understand. Uh, I'll give you an example. One of my kids, Clifton, well, not my, not my, not my child, one of the kids that I trained for a long time since he was literally, I think, 12 until he went to college. He now pitches for Tulane. You can look him up. His name's Clifton Slagle. What's up, Clifton? I know you're not watching, but I'll say what's up anyway. Um, very proud of him. He was a hard thrower all through his youth. He was at the top end of that range. And he was 12. He was throwing like 65, 66, 67 for like an 80-pound kid, right? He got to 80, like 80, I think around 14. And he was just like chugging along like, yep, Clifton's going to throw 90 one day. He got stuck at 80 for like two years. His mechanics were still good. He just like hit his growth spur and then kind of just like he did. He was like, but right between... I don't know what the term is. He just like wasn't quite like a full grown man, but also wasn't a boy either. He was just like in that 15 year old limbo. And so he was like linear, like still hardest thrower and then really plateaued at like 80 to 83 until like his junior year. Then he hurt his back, just like tweaked it playing basketball or whatever, had a month or two off and then came back and he was 84, then 85, then 86. He gained five miles per hour that summer in like a four month span and he hit 90 his senior year. So his progression was like this. And then my hands obscured for here. And then plateau. And then shoom, spiked. And now at Tulane, he's like 88 to 91, something like that. So it's not linear. You'll get these big growth spurts. They'll always be centered. Not always, but they'll very often be centered around puberty. And another, like you hit obviously like your first beginnings of puberty, like 14, 15. Again, that's dependent on every person. Then you hit this like second phase where you definitely muscle up a bit around 16. And then the difference between a 16 year old, as we all know, a sophomore and a, and a senior is pretty significant. You really add another like 15, 20 pounds. And that's where those big bumps typically are seen. So you might go from 70 to 80 in this area, like in over a year, you might gain 10 miles per hour in a year and then two the next year or zero. Right. And then you might gain another five here and then like zero or one. And then you might gain another five. And this is why you have to just like stick with your craft and just keep chugging along, keep doing your arm care. Don't get discouraged. And you just kind of wait your turn. And that's hard. It's, it really is. It's emotionally hard. Um, and my heart goes out to you if you had that plateau, but we've all had it. So Ben, to answer your question, if I throw 80 at, oh, hold on, let me click this. Oh, uh, look at the magic of the internet. Look at that. Oh, that's great. Um, so if I throw 80 at 14, will I still have that same gain? Again, you might, if you throw it, right, do you actually throw 80 at 14? Blink twice if the answer is yes. Obviously, I can't see you. But if you throw 80 at 14, A, congratulations, you're a flamethrower. That's awesome. Um, I don't know. You might, again, if you're if you're 14 and you're like a big kid, you might essentially have already gotten to 16 or 17 developmentally. And your body's just going to like hang out there for a while while everyone else catches up. So you might throw 80 at 15, 16, or you might keep chugging along and throw 140 by the time you're a senior. I, we really just don't know. But all you can do is to keep to stay diligent to your routine, you know, keep working hard, keep doing your arm care, stay regular. I think the hardest thing is when you're out in front early is people tend to coast. You know, if you're the hardest thrower your age, and you just blow fastballs by everybody. What incentive and you throw 80 at 14? What incentive do you have to throw 81 at 14? Right. I think that can be difficult. Um, it's, I think it's really effective a lot of times to be chased by someone else, right? So if you're the middle of the pack, like I was always a middle of the pack kid from high school and on, and I was always hungry to be better than other people. I had people that I wanted to catch and I can't really relate to being in front of other people. So, you know, I think that's, that can be a blessing and also a curse, but you really have to imagine. Um, and that's actually one of the things that's mentioned in my book is that it can be hard to, compare yourself only to those around you. So, you know, Ben, you might be the, the fastest thrower in your county for 14, but going back to my Los Angeles example, if you were to go to Southern California and go to a big tournament, there's going to be a lot of kids like you. And now you're, that might be, give you a kick in the pants where you're like, okay, yeah, I'm good for my local area, but I'm not as good like nationally, right. Or tri-state stuff like that. So, you know, again, keep, keep diligent, keep working hard. Everyone's got to push. Like there's people that you can't see who are in other States who are working harder than you. So you have to keep pushing and working hard, um, to, to, to just keep developing. Don't get complacent. That's a big one. So let's transition a little bit to injuries and I'm going to come back and give you the sort of some action items and some advice about all this stuff 
towards the end because they're going to coincide. The things that you do to prevent injuries are also the same things you do to improve your performance. So that's a nice thing. But let's start with a little poll. And you're not going to be actually able to participate in this poll, but you can just nod your head at home. Do better mechanics mean that you're safe from injury? I get this question. So I get I get emails a lot. I probably get 20, 25 emails from parents a month, um, you know, like one a day, something like that on average. And a lot of them say like, hey, I just want to make sure my son is safe. Um, you know, can you look at his mechanics, blah, blah, blah. And I do have a policy where, I, you know, I get a lot of videos. I, I can't look at everyone's videos. But I give people the same advice, which is that, look, it doesn't matter what I see in your kids' mechanics. There are no safe mechanics. So this is the answer. And this is this is a, a hard question to to answer, because think of it this way. Would you be more likely to injure your ankle if you ran a thousand miles or a hundred miles? Show of hands, a thousand miles, right? Would you be more likely to blow your arm out if you pitched a thousand innings or a hundred innings? A thousand innings, right? Would you be more likely to blow your arm out throwing 95 versus 75? 95, right? Um, the studies are out. The cat's out of the bag. As your velocity increases, the stress through your arm increases. Just like if you're if you're a crane, uh, I mean, you can imagine that you're a piece of machinery right now. If you're a crane and you're lifting a 20,000 pound block, that's going to put more stress through the crane and all the machinery than if it's a 10,000 pound block or a 1,000 pound block, right? So essentially being worse at baseball, getting fewer innings, it, it, it does. That's exactly what uh, our friend here, Clutch Till Dawn said. It limits your exposure to injury. If you're a premium world-class runner and you're you know, running two and a half hour marathons and you're running, again, tons and thousands of miles a year, your likelihood of hurting your quad or pulling a hamstring or rolling an ankle or you know, whatever is significantly increased. Just like I sold my car, I live in the middle of a city. Um, my incidence or my likelihood of dying in a car crash is very low now because I don't drive up and down the highway every day. The more miles you drive on the highway, the higher your likelihood of crashing. Now, let me, let me get past this part of the logic. Pitching is inherently bad for your arm. Look at this picture here. This guy, Oliver Drake, he actually went to the Naval Academy. I don't, I don't know him, but I played against him in college. Uh, I went to college in Maryland. Um, but look at this position. Like this is a major leaguer. And all major leaguers' arms do this. It doesn't matter who you are. His mechanics are quirky, but everyone's arm is doing this to be good. This is what you have to do, get into these crazy positions to throw hard. So when we start to talk, and, and you know, my friend Mike Reinold, who is, he, he works for the White Sox. He was the Boston Red Sox uh, head athletic trainer. He owns a great uh, facility up in Boston. So if you're in that area, definitely look up champion uh, fitness and performance. Um, he says, look, Every, every presentation he goes to, he doesn't BS people. He says throwing is bad for your arm. If you don't want to have any risk of arm injury, stop playing baseball. Or don't pitch. Go to the outfield. Go the, go the short, go to the infield. You know, like catching is a little tougher on the arm, but not nearly as much as pitching. This is, this is what you sign up for. So I'm not saying that because you play baseball, you're going to get injured. I'm just saying that it's almost, it's this weird catch 22. And so for parents, when you teach your kids better mechanics and a good pitching coach is going to help them be, you know, have cleaner mechanics. That's a dumb buzzword, more efficient mechanics, also a buzzword. It just means that your body's not putting extra stress that it doesn't need to put through your arm. Right. And so these major leaguers have mechanics like that. They don't have extra stress. They have the, the, the right amount of stress for their body. Um, but if you can produce 95 miles per hour velocity, that's a lot of stress going through your arm over thousands and thousands and thousands of pitches. So again, it's this catch 22, the better you are, the more you stress your arm out, the more innings you earn because you're the best player on the team, the more innings you get and the more innings you get, the more likely you are, you are to you know, stress your arm and, and, and hurt it. And most players will not suffer a catastrophic injury. And so I want to keep, I want to move on. I don't want to get too long winded, but again, feel free. If you have any questions, like hold them, um, to the end. But yeah, I'm looking through your comments here and you guys are, are right on that. It does it essentially expose you to more injury. But here's the three buckets of injuries that I want to talk about today. Um, I know I'm a little bit behind on the time, but I'll extend uh, if you guys still have more questions. There's growth and innate injuries. This is just like growth plate fractures. And I'm going to cover these and things that are unique to you. I've had Tommy John surgery twice. I actually looked at my um, I wish I had the video, but I don't have it on my computer. Um, I looked at my 15U or 16U recruiting video 
my mechanics were like pretty good for a 15, 16 new kid. I had elbow pain my whole life, whole life. Was it because I had these wacky, awful, terrible mechanics? Absolutely not. I also had good coaches who didn't overuse me. I did not. I was not one of those overused kids as a, as a high schooler or a middle schooler. So for me, I fall into that innate bucket where Dan's body just doesn't like pitching as much as someone else's. Look at Max Scherzer. Dude's thrown like 18,000 innings in his life. Still throws super hard, is amazing, is healthy. It doesn't make any sense. So why do I have a million surgeries and he has zero? Only, you know, who knows? So this is the first bucket. So growth and innate, and this is these are things to understand. These are not really like pitching related. They're just like your body related. Growth plate inflammation is a big one. This is something that will affect young kids, especially, but all the way up, I've seen it to 16-year-old kids. So this is when you're stressing the growth plates, and the growth plate is like this little band where as the bone grows, it's cartilage. It's like a little band of cartilage, and the cartilage like pushes out, and then it becomes bone. And then once you finally are fully grown, that cartilage band, your growth plate, fuses and becomes actual bone, and then your bones will never grow again. So it's common that you'll get pain in your growth plate, which is inflammation. And if that doesn't get better, if you don't race, rest it, it can fracture like this because that's like essentially like the weak link in a chain. And this is not related to throwing. Throwing can make it worse. Throwing can be the thing that irritates it. But it's not really like your mechanics are what cause this pain. This is just like some random kids every year will get this through no fault of their own. It, it might be overuse. It might not. It might be their mechanics. It might not. We don't really know. But basically, they can just do whatever they can do as long as it doesn't cause them pain. That's one of the best examples. And other things are just your body. Again, you'll have 10 kids. They all throw the same amount. They all throw the same speed. But one has an elbow problem. One has a shoulder problem. One has a growth plate problem. Why is there a difference? It's because we all have different bodies. And so that's just something to understand that there isn't always a specific cause that's like, this is the reason little Johnny's hurt, little Johnny's body just might not tolerate pitching as well. Like my body has not. I had elbow pain almost every year, even when I wasn't hurt recovering from Tommy John, I was still kind of pitching in pain. I had two partial tears in my elbow and two full tears. That's a lot of years uh, of recovering from injuries. So we'll talk about that. But again, like the, the big things with growth related pain are listening to your body. So especially parents, if you have a young kid, um, and that's just anywhere, like middle school age, especially if they have elbow pain, get it checked out and get an x-ray. And I don't urge everyone to like, I know like x-rays can be expensive and MRIs can be expensive. You don't have to run an MRI machine every injury. Um, but a, a lot of times when a kid has elbow pain and just like kind of crops up and it's kind of persistent, I often wonder if it could be a growth plate inflammation. So just be cautious with that because you don't want a little bit of growth plate inflammation, which takes four weeks to go away to become this, which requires a big screw to be shot through that elbow to put it back together. Um, number two, overuse and workload. This is a big one. And obviously we know, we've all heard the horror stories. We've seen it. The, the number one pitcher of the high school team in you know rural, you know whatever state, uh, he pitches Monday, 100 pitches, then he pitches again Thursday, 100 pitches, then he pitches again Sunday, right? And we've all seen that pattern. It's terrible. It's getting better, but it still happens more than you think. Again, I live in Illinois, in central Illinois, and as you get really far out into the country, some of these really small schools where they don't have a lot of good baseball players, some of those kids um, who have coaches who either don't care or who don't really put in the time to know, there's still kids who get, get really overused in that pattern, even in the state of Illinois, where they have pitch count limits that are dictated by the high school association. So I've seen this. This is more rampant still than you think it is. Um, it's unfortunate. But overuse can have a lot of look like a lot of different things. And we've heard a lot about it, but this is beyond, this can be growth plate. This is shoulder a tendonitis inflammation, rotator cuff, labrum injuries, um, UCL tears, obviously in your elbow. So with overuse, you have to rest, you need to reduce your workload. But the thing I want to talk about is increasing capacity. And this is important. So here's the thing. Imagine you're going to go run a marathon. You did no training for this marathon. And you run all 26 miles and you tear your Achilles tendon. Is that an overuse injury or is that an under training injury? Is that an underprepared? Is that a lack of capacity? The word here is capacity. And this is a big point that I want to impress upon everyone here tonight. The reason people run four miles, then six miles, then eight miles, then 10 miles, then 12 miles, then they get all the way up to 20, 25 miles before their uh, first marathon 
is because they're trying to build capacity so that this task is not as hard as it otherwise would be. And a lot of times this is the problem with overuse in young players is that their routines are garbage, their arm care reg regimens are non-existent or they're garbage, their strength training does not prepare them to pitch very well, they don't throw enough leading up to the season. So basically what happens is they hit March 1st to go run their marathon and they haven't run one time essentially. And then they, their arm hurts three weeks later and they wonder just the way the runner would, hey, I ran one five mile, you know, I ran one five miler and then did my marathon. Why does my, why is my knee swollen the size of a grapefruit? Well, it's because you didn't prepare well enough. So overuse, a big part of the equation that people are not talking about enough is capacity, increasing your capacity. So that means, again, having a great arm care regimen, building up slower, throwing and throwing and throwing in a linear progression, using a good throwing program to get ready to do the stuff you're going to have to do in the season. That's how pros do it. And the more that trickles down, the better. And this is where your coaches need to come in and, you know, your coaches need to come in and help you with this because it's not easy to organize for a young player. Um, and I'm going to have more videos about building up as the winter progresses. Um, and, and injury type number three is, again, the inherent risk of pitching. And I just want to harp on this a little bit more that, again, parents, you can't look for safe, quote unquote, mechanics because they don't exist. Better mechanics are better mechanics for sure. And they improve your performance, but they don't necessarily dispose you to less risk or expose you. If that was the case, major leaguers wouldn't be hurt. But major leaguers blow their arms out all the time, right? So think about it. They have some of the best mechanics in the world and they're still hurt. So it improves performance. And yes, like if you look at the ASMI guidelines about good mechanics, like there are definitely some joint angles are better than others. And that's what we talk about when we talk about good mechanics. But again, just because you meet those criteria doesn't mean you're going to be safe because you're not. So I just want everyone to understand when you play these different sports, um, you know, soccer, if your kid plays soccer, you're probably more likely to tear your ACL or your meniscus than you are to blow out your arm playing baseball. I don't know if that's the case. I don't have stats on that. But soccer is a really huge risk. You take one bad turn. It's a little bit muddy. You slip. You, your knee goes in. You tear your ACL. And especially in female soccer and women's soccer, there's a ton of ACL tears. And that's related to cue angles and the hips and the knees and all that stuff. Um, so, you know, all these sports, when you sign up for them, there is a risk. And baseball, it's essentially the UCL. You know, I've got I've had Tommy done twice. I got to get on camera. Um, you can see my scar there. Now, I'm not saying that just to be you know, like, don't be um, red. What's the word here? Real, meh, struggling my words here. Um, I'm not saying that you're going to be hurt because most players don't still most players don't get Tommy John. Most players don't get shoulder injuries. And the nice thing is we're in an era where shoulder injuries are more preventable, more preventable than they ever have been. And that's because arm care really, really works for protecting your shoulders because you can directly strengthen all these muscles in your rotator cuff and in your shoulder. And that directly protects and stabilizes this joint. So arm care for your shoulder is critical. Shoulder shoulder injuries have plummeted. Elbow injuries have skyrocketed. And I think that's in a sense because our shoulders are so strong that we can put more mileage on our arm and we can't directly strengthen that elbow. And that's what's tough. So this was a joke here. Golf, uh, you know, all you golfers that go out constantly, uh, you know, to the links, um, little, little tempered humor here. So um, I am still monitoring the chat. Don't worry. I will get to these. I'll scroll back through towards the end. Um, but yes, to my central Illinois people. Hello. Um, so let me just talk real quick about my injury path. Again, I had pain as a kid, um, but I increased my tolerance through good training. I was a, a student of my craft for sure in, in college and beyond. And so what I used to hurt my arm at 78 miles per hour, I was able to throw, you know, in the, in the low to mid nineties as a pro guy and be mostly on the field, like mostly healthy, right? I, I could pitch. So that's me increasing my capacity where good training allowed me not only to throw hard, but also to, if I was going to be injured, I was going to be injured at 95, not 78. Like 78 was no longer going to hurt my arm when I was older. So again, this gives you time to accumulate even more. And if I hadn't played six years of pro ball, I wouldn't have had that second, that second elbow surgery, right? So playing longer, extending that checkpoint, just like in a, one of those racing video games. I always played Daytona 500 when I was a kid in the arcade. If you make it to that next checkpoint, you can always crash after it, right? So if you make it to the next checkpoint, it gives you another opportunity to get in a wreck. So just understand that you do everything you can to train well, to improve your mechanics, to be diligent and have a great routine. Um, but it's never going to eliminate that inherent risk because throwing is really bad 
for your arm. You know, you can quit baseball. You can play the outfield. Yeah. Why would you ever want to throw slower? Like you wouldn't just throwing is tough on your arm. So just understand that there's not safe mechanics, but here's the thing. This is the last thing I want to touch on um, before we kind of go to the last stuff and then we'll get a Q and a pain is not normal for your body. So what this means is the way Randy Johnson throws, if those of you remember the big unit, um, the way he threw was fine. Randy Johnson was a very healthy pitcher. But if I try to throw like Randy Johnson, I might be injured right away. And the amount of stress that might go through Jacob deGrom's elbow might be like higher than mine, but I get injured in a lower stress level than he does. So everyone's me mechanics and the stress that their body can handle is unique to them. And that's what they try to do when they take bio biomechanical measurements is they try to get a baseline. So they said, Dan, we did your mechanical analysis and we know that there's a hundred units of stress floating through your elbow on every pitch. So, but if halfway through the season, they do another analysis and now my, there's 120 units. So I'm doing 20% more stress. They're like, Hey, what's going on? That's not normal. You we're afraid now that you're putting more stress on your arm that you might get injured soon because you're putting 20% more stress because of some mechanical change than is normal for you. And that's essentially what biomechanics, um, you know, like some of these markers and, and these analysis are trying to do is say, Hey, and they've been trying to do this for a long time is what is, Pitcher X's baseline. What is Johnny Holstaff's baseline? Can we monitor him and make sure that if he gets above baseline, we can try to get him back to baseline? So that's more of the thing that you're trying to do. You specifically, what is what works for you and what doesn't? The last anecdote I'll tell you is that when I was coming back from Tommy John, I could throw a certain way and it would hurt my elbow. And then I could make a little adjustment. I can't tell you what they were. And then it wouldn't hurt. So I could tell that from one pitch to the next, which, which was safe mechanics for me. And which was not because my elbow was still repairing itself. And it could say, okay, hey, that's not okay. With, we don't like that amount of stress. Do it a different way. It feels better. Um, you're not going to get that. And I don't want you to be hurt to have to experience, experience that. But, you know, there is that individuality part of it. So what should we do here? Number one, you've got to have an arm care regimen. Here's the thing. If you're really young, you're 10, 11, 12, 13, this is a really boring thing that sucks the joy out of baseball. Arm care sucks. It's just terrible. But you got to do it to an extent. So if you're really young, like 13 and under, I would say weight training is the biggest thing you should do. But again, weight training is hard too. It becomes a job. I don't want you to have feel like baseball is a job too young. So understand that parents, your kids got to be ready to do this because once they start weight training, they're going to do it the rest of their career. Because it's not like you're going to do weight training from 12 to 14, then take 15 to 16 off. Like, no, it's, it's when it's go time, it's go time, right? So you have to understand that Weight training is arm care. When you learn to do good rows, you get stronger in your back, you do a good push up. When you do a push up, you're strengthening your rotator cuff to a degree. You're strengthening your core, you're strengthening your serratus anterior, these muscles here that are part of your rotator cuff. Weight training is arm care. So don't forget that. It's very important. If that's the only thing your kid does, that's still a good start as long as it's a decent program. If it's the, the standard of football, like power cleans and overhead press, that's not good. But if you have a good weight training program from a reputable sports performance place, that's a great start. Arm care is a great addition to that, especially if you're a high schooler. It's like a necessity. And then once you're, you know, second half of high school and beyond, it's, it absolutely has to be there. Number three is calories. You have to have a paid to eat mindset. If you want to be, again, we go back to the, the kid who's bigger at seven, the kid who's bigger at 15 throws harder than the kid who's small at 15. So you've got to eat, eat, eat. When you lift weights, get your gains with a Z, whatever, um, by eating. Imagine it's what you're paid to do, and it really could be. If you get bigger and bigger and bigger and throw harder and harder and harder, that scholarship money might increase. And that's not why you should be playing. You shouldn't be playing for a scholarship. You should be playing because you love it, but that's still a factor. Eat. Eat because your food becomes your muscles. Um, you also need to love throwing, and I can't. You, no one's going to fix this for you, but parents just understand that if your kid doesn't want to go out and do all this stuff, probably not going to be a long-term there's not going to be any greatness probably in your kid if he doesn't love throwing like really love it that's your thing throwing in itself is kind of a tedious it's not like the super exciting thing but like i loved it to death i couldn't tell you why but in all my picture buddies that we talk about we reminisce we all just loved throwing it was just a fun thing we did and so you become a craftsman and that's also really important because even if you have all these drills even if you soak up all my youtube stuff and and go out and do it, you've got to go out and do it and tinker. And like I said, figure out what works for you. And the more you throw, the more your body will figure out what's best for you. Because even if you have drills, 
you have to end up at some point being your own coach as a player. And so parents just, just watch, what do your kids do? Um, you know, should, uh, it, it, are they really self-motivated? And lastly, obviously great coaches are important. So ask good questions, you know, ask them about their plan, ask them about the winner. How, how are you going to, they're going to help build your kids up for, again, to be, have the capacity to pitch and not be underprepared for a long season. So ask good questions. And this takes some emotional intelligence. Um, you know, I've read a lot of books about you know, how to deal well with people, how to be, you know, how to get the best. Like I had some tough parents to interact with in my baseball academy. So I tried to learn a lot of strategies to have some emotional intelligence and and try to really get along and help people understand what I was trying to do and also to listen and hear them out. So you have to really be you have to be smart about your interactions with coaches. You can't just be like, hey, what are you doing? Why are we doing this? That's not going to get you anywhere. You have to be really really thoughtful in the way you approach coaches, but you should ask and figure out if they're going to be right for your kid and really get them prepared for the long term. Um, and lastly, shortcuts are a bad idea. Weighted balls, a lot of the way a lot of people use them, certainly not all, and I'm not demonizing them, um, is that shortcuts are a bad idea. If you're not already doing arm care religiously, you're not already doing strength training, you're not already a craftsman, a student of throwing and really like tuned into fi fixing your mechanics, don't throw weighted balls. That's making it a shortcut. You're trying to, I'm not going to do weight training. I'm not going to do arm care, but I am going to do weighted balls. That's a bad, bad way to go about it. And this is what a lot of coaches talk about that. Hey, you need to be prepared to do weighted balls if that's something that you want to do. And what they mean when they say that, I think, is that you need to have all the foundation laid, right? Strength training, arm care. You build up that capacity for throwing. And then if you want to do some weighted balls on top of that, then they're probably not a big deal because, um, you know, there's no there's no. You know, God didn't come down and say a baseball should be five ounces. It's perfect for the human body. That's not how it worked, right? Footballs are 14 ounces. Softballs are seven ounces. The weight of the ball is honestly arbitrary. So let's do some Q&A because there's a bunch in the chat here, and I want to get to it. Um, sounds like the uh, DC Knight is uh, coming alive. So let me scroll back through here. Um, bone spurs, yes, big, uh, big, big problem here. So let's talk first. Um, weight training. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, how does Jacob deGrom so, throw so hard? I don't know. He is a freak of nature. He does look like a bean pole. That is correct. Um, Jason, this is a good question. This is where I want to start here. Do you agree with, uh, the argument that a late or flat arm at foot plant is generally bad and causes excess stress on the arm? Yes, I do. Um, I don't have numbers for that. But again, in like talking with some people who are more in the medical realm than me, um, I'll throw out Mike Reynolds name again. Again, check him out on Twitter. Follow him. Mike Reynold is an absolutely amazing resource for parents for keeping your kids arms healthy and for smart training. So Mike Reynold, R-E-I-N-O-L-D. Um, a lot of the stuff about mechanics I have learned and soaked up from him and his website. Yes. When you land, and I touched on this in two recent videos, including my big mechanics video that's like 40 minutes long. It's on YouTube. When you land, your arm should be, I got to get over a little bit. Your arm should be slightly above parallel. So like here, not, and what, uh, what Jason you're asking is flat or like late. This is essentially late. And basically what happens is if you're down here, your body starts to rotate and this is dragging behind and you don't get on top of the ball when it's really time to accelerate it downhill. So yes, when your foot strikes, you should be slightly above in this like 10, 11 o'clock. <laughs> Oh, this is not going to work. I'm trying. It should be like this, not flat like that when your foot strikes. And I do cover this in a couple of different videos. And I might do one that's just um, just on its own about arm timing. But that's an important thing. And this is one of the things that you, when you're working through mechanics that you want to try, if the kid's really late or he's really, really early, you want to try to clean that up. Which way do I need to go to be more on camera? OK, there we go. So that's an important. That was a great question. Um, so you, the answer is yes there. Let me find a new question. Okay. Um, okay. What's the best way to strengthen your tendons and connective tissue without overbuilding your muscles? Do you work on this? Um, so here's the thing. The reason elbows are still lagging behind, still not on camera all the way. Um, I want to get this out of my way. Slides off. Okay. The reason elbows lag behind is because the elbow is a passive structure. Obviously, the UCL is a ligament, not a, not a tendon. 
tendons can be strengthened over time. Ligaments can kind of be strengthened over time. Um, obviously a tendon becomes a ligament in Tommy John surgery. Um, but you can't, there's no, there's no direct tendon strengthening exercise, strength training and the, you know, progressive overload, which is weight training, which is, you know, doing more reps and, um, you know, more weight over time, that's progressive overload that increases the load to your tendons and your muscles. Cause muscles, if you don't know the physiology, there's the muscle belly and then the tendon connects your muscle to, um, to bone. So ligaments connect bone to bone, tendons connect muscle to bone. So you can't directly strengthen a tendon. You can strengthen the muscle and load your body. And that strengthens your tendon because the muscle is being loaded because they're all being stretched and, and getting tension together. So no, I did not strengthen my tendons and connective tissue because there isn't really any way to do that except from other, other exercises. Um, during Tommy John, some of the stuff I did that was unique was a, I threw to a radar gun instead of distances. So I really made my, my loads progressive rather than just throwing 120 feet, and 150 feet, which is kind of vague because you could throw a missile at 120 feet then throw it soft at 150. And that's not like progressive, right? I did a lot of finger strengthening. I did a lot of unique sort of rock climbing based, um, training. Now I wasn't doing rock climbing, but I was, there's a lot of training tools for rock climbers that really focus on tendon health of your arm and strengthening individual fingers and stuff like that. So I did a lot of stuff like that to strengthen my, um, to strengthen my arms. Uh, that was a good question. Uh, Leo Mazzoni, and I'm trying to keep up with the chat here. I really appreciate everyone's questions. I'm going to get to as many as I can. Um, Leo Mazzoni, I grew up a Braves fan. I'm not really a Braves fan anymore, uh, but I was a Braves fan. I lived through the Leo Mazzoni era. I'm not bought into Leo Mazzoni, and here's why. Leo Mazzoni never really had a bad pitching staff. Who could be a bad pitching coach when you have Greg Maddox, John Smoltz, Tom Glavin, and all the other amazing relievers they had. I mean, Steve Avery was amazing for a while uh, as a starter. So Leo Mazzoni essentially got the keys to all these Ferraris and was a very well-known pitching coach because of it. But I'm not sure that Leo Mazzoni was successful because he did that or because of his coaching or because those guys were just amazing. And now a lot of his advice seems a little bit outdated. And what I do like about Leo Mazzoni is that he preaches um, – command and we should be preaching command more than we preach philosophy. So I do appreciate, and that's, that's timeless. That's timeless advice that command should come before velocity, especially for youth pitchers. You should be focusing on hitting your spot more than just grunting and just hucking the ball down the middle of the plate. However, this whole velocity versus command debate, it, it really isn't a debate. You need to do both. You need to learn to throw really hard and you need to learn to command the ball. There's not one or the other. And if there was one versus the other, unfortunately, it's probably velocity to get recruited. And I hate saying that because I wish it wasn't that way. But if you're throwing 76 and hitting spots, you're not going to you know, go play in college at a higher level if you threw 86 and have a little less command. If you have 86 and terrible command, you're not going anywhere either. But, you know, I think Leo Mazzoni is trying to stay relevant. And I think he has a lot of great experience. But I don't think the preaching of command stuff is really that, that important. I wish Leo Mazzoni was, was more speaking to the mindset of many of his pitchers, which I know he is to an extent, but there's so much nuance that you get in the big leagues, I'm sure. And I got a lot of nuance in the low levels of, you know, the minors that I wish I could have experienced some of that major league knowledge and experience, but I don't know. I, I, I wish, th I wish there was more nuance coming from the former big league pitching guys and coaches than just this like talk of, of, you know, oh, velocity is not everything. I just don't, I think that's a tired conversation. That's not helpful. Um, Great question from Kyle. Um, do you believe in breaks in the off season? So mentally, yes. Do I believe here's the, here's where the throwing advice gets confusing because they do. If you look at the ASMI guidelines, the MLB pitch smart, uh, they, they want you to get two or three months off from competitive baseball and from pitching. And you absolutely should do that. But what I think a lot of people interpret that as is two to three months off from throwing, which I don't think is necessary. Again, talk about capacity again. Talk about runners. And not every sport is a good analogy for baseball, so don't take this too far. But do you need to take three months off from running every year? Or can you just run a little less when it's not your like competitive season if you're a competitive runner? And I think I think a good model, because again, if you, if you let your capacity and your conditioning for throwing go to zero after the season, and then build up from zero, that's harder than if you just want to play catch 
and throw and spin your curveballs playing catch and throw flat grounds, but not throw full speed for a couple months, I think that's fine and healthy. Um, if you want to play short, you want to take ground balls from across the diamond. But I think when kids are, are pitching competitively nine or 12 months out of the year, that's really terrible because they're going to the red zone with their arms. They're throwing full speed in games, spinning all their stuff. And that's a lot of, a lot of usage. So I think the break is important mentally. If kids want to play a different sport, they absolutely should do that. Throw baseball in the closet for a while and play football, play basketball. You learn a lot of other stuff from those sports. That's great. But if you want to keep throwing, I think you can. I just think it needs to be sub maximal for a, a good period. And that just means go play catch with your dad or your friends for a couple of days a week, you know, in, in September, October, November, but just don't, don't go long toss like crazy and don't throw full speed. I think that's, I think that can keep your arm in good condition while not putting much stress on it. Cause again, short stops aren't blowing their arms out and short stops, especially the Latin American ones, they're going to go play winter ball. They're playing, they're throwing almost all year. So you talk about how much they throw and they're still healthy. I think there's a protective effect there. You just need to find the, the find the balance. But that's a great question. Thanks for thanks for asking that. Um, let me let me give me one sec. That's a lot of questions. It's great. Um, how important is running and cardio? So I like that question. So running, especially distance running, has been demonized because people say, "Well, when you pitch, you sprint. When, you know, it's like a sprint. When you swing, it's a full full effort. It's like a sprint. You know, it's like a sprint." When you play short, you only sprint, which is all true. It's all true. When people say, well, you know, jogging, it doesn't match your energy systems, which is true. However, there's just something to be said for being in good shape in general. So I like everything in life, there is a balance. Now, one of the, one of the, my experiences where you start to learn that there's not like this black and white way about life is in pro ball you get really run down and your body just starts to hurt. So if you're like, I'm only going to sprint because I'm a reliever and you know, jogging's bad for you. I've told, I've written this before. I'm like, yeah, go tell that to the, the bullpen when it's August and guys knees hurt, their ankles hurt. I personally, my Achilles tendons would get swollen in like July, August. I think it's because of my flat feet, but like running was hard for me in August. It's super hot at 3 PM and I'm exhausted. My, my Achilles hurt. They're swollen. Um, guys are just like banged up and you want us just to go sprint every day for our conditioning and you have to sprint a decent amount to stay in good shape. Right? So if you're asking players to sprint in the heat of August, 95 degrees at 2 PM, when they're just kind of banged up, it's just unrealistic. So some days guys are like, look, I can't sprint today. I just, I'm going to go run 12 poles because I want to get the blood flowing. I need to get some conditioning in. I need to stay not fat. I need to just like, I need to get my heart going. So they go run a little bit. But I know a lot of coaches who don't get that. They're like, oh, he's he's. But here's the thing. You don't see guys throw slower because they jog once a week. That's not how it works. If that was like no one would have thrown hard back in the day. So I think there's a balance. If here's my here's my recommendation. I think pitchers should do more sprint work than distance by by a good, good amount, probably by two to one margin or two to one ratio. But if you want to do one longer run a week, like a 30 minute run, that's fine. I wouldn't do more than one of those. And then if you want to do like a short run, like an interval run, like a 15 minute, like you run 200 yards and walk 100 yards, or you run 400 meters and walk 100 meters, whether you want to do imperial or, or metric system, whatever. Um, I think there's a balance. So for me personally, I liked doing one distance day, one interval day, and then like two sprint days. And then that's about it. Four days of conditioning. But you should be in good shape. And I don't think players... Uh, I don't, I think there's a lot of mis mixed messaging today on cardio and running. And again, life is not black and white. Don't feel like you're hurting your velocity because it's not going to drop. I ran distance. My velocity never dropped because of it. So great question. Appreciate um, you asking. Let me find, I'm going to scroll back. I don't want to use only new questions. Um, let's all right. There's the Jacob deGrom one. Da, 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 da. Yes. Weight training is the best. Here's a good one. Tay, should a pitcher bench press? Bench press was demonized. Bench press is just like any other press, except you're a little bit more locked into position with your arms. This isn't great for your shoulders. If you just put your arms up and do this, you feel like pinches in your shoulders. Um, here's my thing with bench press. There's dumbbell bench press, which is a little more shoulder friendly. You also get more stability because when these are not together on a bar, you have to hold each dumbbell up. So you're getting some shoulder stability. Again, this goes back to weight training being arm care. A dumbbell bench press is better than a regular bench press because, again, I'm holding two 40-pound dumbbells. My shoulders have to stabilize them as they're coming down, and I'm pressing them up. So that's a great example 
um, of, I'm glad you asked this question. It's a great example of strength training being arm care that has a, a legitimate stability benefit to your shoulders. Um, so when it, for me, we never did bench press in my baseball academy. We did, we did a very extensive weight room. We were half weight room, half baseball academy. We were very passionate about our strength training. Um, we didn't do bench press straight bar bench, not because it's like this evil exercise, just because there were better varieties. We would do landmine press, which is when you have a barbell like angled into the wall or like a little landmine swivel attachment, you press the barbell up. It's very safe. It's great for younger kids. We would do tons of dumbbell uh, variations. We would lay on the floor. So you sit your arms on the floor and then you press up from a, from a standstill. It's called a floor bench. You could do it with a straight bar or dumbbells. Again, we always did dumbbells. Um, and then we did a ton of push up push-up variations. So when you have all those push-up variations, lots of different ways to do dumbbell with a flat bench, incline bench. An incline bench is definitely safer on your shoulders because you have a, a limited range of motion. Because when I'm, I'm on an incline, my elbow is not going as far behind my body. And that's where you get into, into trouble. It's when, when bench allows you to get far behind your body with your shoulders, from that deficit, it's a little bit tougher on your shoulders. And so power lifters who really have banged up shoulders because of really heavy bench pressing, they say they swear by incline bench. They say it's a lot healthier on the shoulders and that the really heavy bench where they have like these bars that bend down. So it allows them to get really low. That's where the shoulder injuries come from. So, again, it's not that it's a terrible exercise. It's just that there's a laundry list of better pressing variations, push ups, dumbbell, incline, floor bench are three great ones and landmines. Landmines are very safe for younger kids, kids. So great question. So you don't have to not do bench press. It's just probably not the best tool for that, for that job. Um, Hector, what do you got here? Um, talking about weighted balls. I have a 10 year old and we have a three ounce and four ounce ball, man. I don't like lighter balls. And here's the thing. And I don't have any, I don't, I have nothing more than anecdote, but I threw weighted balls myself. Um, a couple of years, there was nothing that kids in my academy didn't do that I did. We did a weighted ball program for a couple of years. Then I scrapped it. I just didn't feel enough comfortable with it. And full disclosure, we had two kids get Tommy John surgery in the nine years we were open, only two. It's a very low rate. We had a lot of pitchers come through and they did a weighted ball program. They did 30 throws with weighted balls twice a week for a eight to 12 week period. It was a very short window of time. Like it was a very low volume. We didn't go below four ounces. And they would only do like four throws of four ounce, four of the five, four of the six, four of the eight, maybe. It was a very, like, honestly, pretty conservative program. So I'm certainly not attributing the weight of balls to them getting injured. They were both also very overused as kids. Anyway, that's a long story. But after that, I decided, you know, with the time that I could spend on my players, I wanted to spend it more on working on developing, you know, their, their pitch grips, more on their mechanics. If you only have a certain amount of time and I only had two hours a week with most of these pitchers or maybe three hours a week, I just wanted to put, put more of it into pitching, like actual pitching and command and mechanics and, and spinning their stuff rather than focus on velocity. And guess what? The velocity came up anyway. So we had a lot of kids that got to the, the mid eighties, some to 90 and they were good pitchers too. They had really good changeups, really good breaking balls and good mechanics. So we had a very good track record with injuries. But anyway, so what I'm going to tell you is that I, there's nothing my kids didn't do that I didn't do myself. My arm felt bad throwing lighter balls. They just go so fast. There's like this really high tension that you feel flow through your arm. And I just felt, uh, you know, again, I don't have data for this. Like I didn't have, back when we were really doing that program, we didn't have like the modus sleeves or really way to, ways to track stuff. Um, and I scrapped it before a lot of the technology came out, but I just felt like th what I was doing was dangerous. That's how it felt on my body. So take that for what it's worth. Um, and the other thing that I felt was also gave me that same feeling. Like my arm was like, like, uh, Dan, can we stop? <laughs> was throwing a softball as hard as I could. I could throw a softball. Like I think 84 was the hardest I threw a softball. And my arm literally felt terrible doing that because that softball is so big if you've ever thrown a beach ball on the beach, you know, the harder you try to throw that beach ball, what happens to it? It goes up because you can't get your hands above the beach ball. And with a softball, they're so much bigger than a baseball that the harder you throw it, the earlier they start to roll out of your hand. And so at 80 miles per hour, I couldn't get a like as hard as I tried and I have good body control. I could not throw a softball below head height. I was like trying to throw it downhill, you know, like I would a baseball. You like when you throw your best, you want it to be downhill. I could not throw a softball at 80 miles per hour downhill to save my life. I don't think I had the forearm strength 
to like actually press it down, even though I was a pretty strong, well-conditioned guy. So the bigger ball, the softball, which you, you're probably not worried about, but, um, and the lighter balls, they just made my arm feel bad. I think staying in that, that plus or minus like 20%, 40%, I think four ounces is okay. I'd still be careful. Um, the six ounce, seven ounce, eight ounce, those are going down in velocity. Those seem to be safer for the arm. It really seems like velocity more than the weight is the scary thing. So like throwing footballs, football guys are healthy, right? So I don't think the, the heaviness is much to be concerned about. I think the lighter ones are really more to be cautious with. And that was a long answer, but I hope that was a little bit helpful. Be cautious with three and four ounce. Um, let's keep going here. Oh, another person asked about bench press. That's great. Um, let's see. Let's do a pitch grip one. Uh, so Corbin, you asked, you said I'm 14 and I was testing out different pitches. I started throwing a slider and it had more down movement than side. Why is that? You know, it, it, there's nothing wrong. I think if you have, if you're in a part of the country, one of the nice pieces of technology, which it can be overused, but it can definitely be prescriptive and helpful is the Rapsido. Um, so if there is a facility around you where you want it, like they can, you can throw off the mound and they can put the Rapsido on you. They can look at the spin and, and all that stuff. That's really valuable if you're getting older and, um, you're just trying to really like tinker with your pitch stuff. So that can be valuable. But here's the thing. Remember Brad Lidge, who was what he had 50 saves and no blown saves for the Phillies back in the early two thousands, Brad Lidge, if you remember him, his slider was mostly down. I don't think there's any one way to throw a slider. Most of them are going to have a combination, obviously of downward and lateral break. That's like essentially what a slider is. And when you throw it with the mixture of uh, gyro spin and top spin, I have a baseball around here somewhere. Um, you know, a slider is a combination of gyro spin, which is bullet spin, like it's spinning towards, um, you know, like this as it comes towards your target. And it's a mixture of some top spin added, right? So you get to the top of a slider and you're spinning it a combination of sideways and forward. So it mixes. That's probably the best way I can describe it. Um, and that's typically going to produce the, you know, the, the half lateral, half downward action that you see. But if yours doesn't do that, Ask your teammates, ask your peers, ask if you play inter, or, uh, inter squad games or if you're just ask your catcher, like, how good is my slider? If it goes down and it's like really good, like Brad Lidges was, so be it. Doesn't matter. Um, if it goes down and it's because maybe something's wrong, something's off, then maybe we need a troubleshoot and see if we can get that that second plane of movement added. But um, I'm not sure why it would be doing that. But again, that's that's another good reason just to tinker. And this is what guys did before wraps. So this is why, you know, if anyone's asking about technology, a lot of technology. Oh, I had a little list of stuff that were, um, you know, I'll put this back up. Here were some ideas if you needed uh, questions. Um, I'll take this off in a second. But, uh, you know, if, if someone's asking, like, do we need to spend money on all this technology? I didn't have it. You know, like Felix Hernandez, who had all like the nastiest stuff ever. He didn't have it. Oh, I mean, this is a random example, but um Guys got along just fine without technology for a while. And of course, yeah, their they're, they're, pitches are probably sharper than they ever were. But guys figured it out before that. And the way they figured it out was they throw a bullpen and they talk to their catcher. And their catcher says, hey, that third slider was filthy. What did you do different? You go, oh, well, I was a little bit here. That one came off this way. So honestly, having a good feedback loop between you and your catch partner is really important. That's what all of us guys would do in pregame everyone, all the relievers are playing catch at four o'clock PM. And we're saying, Hey, let me spin a couple of curveballs. And like, Oh dude, that one was good. This one, you got on the side of it. That one was like this. So just throw, find a trusted friend, throw your slider to him, tinker with it. And if he says, Hey, that one that, that zagged a little bit, that had a little bit of lateral movement was sharper than your normal one that only goes down. There you go. That's all you need to know. So then start working with that and see if you can reproduce it. So you just keep tinkering until you find the best version of that slider, but that's a good, that's a good question. And that's, that's what pitching is. It's, it's tinkering and having, so you got to go out and be sociable and ask, say, Hey, how'd that one look? How'd that one look? How'd that one look? Be a pest. If they don't like it. Find a new throwing partner. Um, yep. Reinold, R E I N O L D Mike Reinold. He is, he's the gold standard of, uh, of PT advice out there for pitchers. Great guy. Um, what would be your advice for, let's see here. For a recreational ball player who wants to make JV to start his high school sports career, positions in consideration, center field and catcher. Those are very different uh, positions, obviously. So 
you know, body types are changing. So it's not like you have to be this big, thick person to be a catcher anymore. Um, you know, there's some very athletic and more, more slim, you know, like there's guys who could take off their catching gear and go throw on, you know, throw them in left field and they fit just fine. Right. Their guys are built the same as Nolan Arenado playing third that are behind the plate, which I think is great. Um, you know, if you're a recreational baseball player, you're still trying to find your fit. So just look, go for foot speed. If you've got a lot of foot speed, go in the outfield. If you've got the tenacity to be catcher, and here's the thing about catcher. That's why this one's a little, that strikes me a little bit of an outlier. Um, catching is not for the faint of heart. And I had words with one of my 15 U players about this uh, in the past, wh which was that um, I, he just was kind of lazy behind the plate. I'm like, look, dude, you told me you want to play in college. Is that correct? He's like, yep. I'm like, well, guess what? You cannot take one pitch off if you're going to be a college catcher. The scout comes out and watches you lazily block one of those balls. It could be the 39th slider of the day, or the second game of the doubleheader. No one cares. Catchers are some of the hardest working people, and the bar is extremely high. Because if you take one pitch off and you let my slider go beneath you and it goes to the backstop and the runner scores, that's you. That's like you striking out with the bases loaded for the team that day. And that's, that's purely on hustle and, and effort. So catching the people that are going to start that journey as a catcher – You've got to be mentally locked in 130 pitches a game and you can take zero pitches off. And if you're going to show some laziness, I mean, I could go to, I go to a youth baseball tournament today, go watch all the catchers and just be like, he won't be a college catcher. He won't be a college catcher. He won't be a college catcher unless someone intervenes and sets them straight because you see any lack of focus and laziness, it's not going to work because there's, and, and you got to catch bullpens. It's a hard position. It's a yeoman, a yeoman position, right? You're working the fields all day and you can't complain about it. So I would say if you're a recreational player, if you're not really gung ho about being a catcher, then cross it off your list and play the outfield, especially if you've got some foot speed. But positions, I've got a couple of videos on positions on my YouTube channel. So definitely check those out. Body type and your skills are a big dictator um, of, of what positions are going to fit you really well. But, you know, at the, especially when you're younger, tinker, play different positions, see what you like, try catcher to see how it is and maybe you do have a passion for it, but to be a higher level player, it's a, uh, it's a hard position. I mean, hats off to catchers. Again, th the bar is very high for them. Um, let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. All right, let's start with this arm question. So sad boy, I hope you feel better by the way. Um, thanks to our uh, info about arm care, 25 years old, recently started learning how to pitch and play baseball. You know, here's, here's, I don't want to get too into the weeds on this. Here's the one thing to understand for everyone who's an adult. And I do appreciate, I have more content coming out soon for my recreational adult players. I do, I do care about everyone, all the different segments of people um, on my channel. The thing with picking up baseball later in life is that your arm will never do what my arm can do, which is lay back really, really far in that disgusting way. And that is because, uh, and I'll pull that photo back up. When you're young, when you play catch when you're young and your growth plates are still open and your joints are a little bit looser, what happens is this thing called humeral retroversion. So your humerus, which is your upper arm bone, it actually rotates backward permanently. So if you look at the arms of, of baseball and softball players who started playing catch when they were young, who played baseball as kids, they get this physical permanent bony adaptation. So their arm physically rotates back in the socket to allow their arm to go back farther. If you miss that window, so you, meaning you didn't play baseball as a kid, you'll never get that. So you could have perfect mechanics. Your mechanics could look exactly like mine at, you know, in five years, whatever, in a year, but you wouldn't be able to, your arm wouldn't physically be able to lay as far back as mine could because I didn't miss that window when I was a kid. Now, that's not to say that you can't be a successful player as an adult, because you can. And especially for recreational baseball, you just need core skills. You need to be to hustle, focus, hit, field, and just make the casual throw across the diamond. Like the, the bar is not super high for adult recreational baseball just to have fun and enjoy the sport. So don't be discouraged. And you should just train just like any other pitcher. There's no difference. Put in as much work as you want. Focus on your mechanics. The only thing to understand is that th that you will have a governor on your car, your engine, essentially, because your arm doesn't have that adaptation that kids have that, that you get when you're young. It's you have to do that when you're young. Otherwise, you miss the boat. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, you know, arm care is probably less important for you right now as it is just throwing. You need to get your throwing volume up. The more you throw, the better you're going to get at throwing, the more your arm is going to learn what it needs to do. Because again, that's going back to being a craftsman and really um, your body will figure out a lot the more you throw. And, and this is, again, where long toss is a good tool, especially for younger players or people who are developing, you know, what, regardless of your age. If you can figure out, hey, if I do things this way, I can throw a ball 150 feet. If I do it this way, I can throw it 170 feet. That's a huge development. That's saying, hey, I found a better way for my body to do the same job. And you're learning better mechanics through that. I didn't have a pitching coach most of my youth. I long toss like crazy and I love throwing. So my body figured out how to do things better just because I want to throw the ball farther. Right. I loved long toss with my dad and my friends. So when you're just trying to throw it a little bit farther, your body starts to just figure it out. And that's one of the cool things about it. So good luck to you. I hope I hope it works out. If you love it and baseball is really fun, go for it. Right. doesn't matter what age you're starting. Um, da, 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 let's see here. Um, OK, let's see. Oh, OK, I, sorry. I see your follow up question about the you're a good runner. You so that's why you're considering center field, but you also love catcher. You know, try them both. Uh, you know, I, again, just tinker and see what you really love. I mean, again, baseball is about being about being fun. So if you enjoy it, then go for it. Uh, da, 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 da. What should I say is an infielder to help encourage my pitcher on the mound? Just cheer for him in the background. Uh, I wouldn't go up on the mound because you might piss him off. If you went on my mound, I'd tell you to get off and get out of my face because what do you know about pitching? Get out of here, you infielder. But, uh, you know, just cheer for him in the background. Be a voice where they hear like, hey, you can do it. That's all. Just, you know, be another voice that they can hear because they'll hear you better than they'll hear the people in the stands. Um, what do I think of clean fuego? So I do know what this thing is. Um, I don't think I can pull it up. Clean fuego is that's a brand name for essentially like a baseball with like the halves cut off. So if I took this, this ball and I cut off the round parts of it. So it's just like a, essentially like a can of like, a, of like a, like a, I'm not going to, you know, like a hockey puck, better example. Uh, if you chopped off the edges of this, so this looks like a hockey puck. Then when you throw it, it's going to force you, if you have like you're off on the spin, it's going to wobble. Because if you ever try to throw a hockey puck, and I actually did this before Clean Fuego came out. This was many years ago. I asked a baseball bat manufacturer, I, I knew the guy, I asked him, can you take a billet of a bat and chop it up into slices for me? So I got, I got, you know, these two and three quarter inch diameter slices of maple wood that were cut about two inches wide. And we would do that. We would throw these and they were essentially just like a slightly thicker hockey puck. Cause I think hockey pucks are a little bit thin. Um, so it's like a thicker wooden hockey puck that we would throw. And if you throw it and you're really like right down through the center of it, it would be really, it would rotate really smooth. If you kind of got off to one side and you cut it or you like roll on the inside of it, then it would wobble as you throw it and you would see it and it would feel bad in your hand. So I think the premise behind clean fuego is the same exact thing. And if that helps you or, you know, players you're working with get the feel of being through the center of the ball, then great. I think that's a tool that has, that has some real merit. A lot of these tools out there are kind of like just like a little bit of a fad or maybe they're just like not that important. Um, even if they have some validity, it's just like might not be worth like the, even like the 10 bucks, but I think that one has some validity to it. And like I said, I, I acted on that premise uh, as probably 10 years ago now. But we did, especially with softball players, you don't get coached much about being through the center of the ball. And so we use it with them a lot, too, just working on their throwing. So that's a good question. Um, let me hide that one. Uh, there's some bickering about how hard players throw in the comments. So that's wonderful. Um, what should I say? Is an, oh, I already covered that one. Da, 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 da. Let's see. Talk about pain. Um, I'm not going to cover, this is a good one for ice. I'm not going to cover hitting. I see the hitting question. Um, so Sean asked as a pitcher, what advice would you tell hitters to have better approaches at the plate? Actually, let me, let me cover that in a second. Cause I, I actually do like that conversation. Um, so this one by Sean, uh, say you throw hundred pitches, heat, ice or nothing. What would you do if you felt fine? I think, I think the, I think ice has kind of been exposed as a fraud at this point. Um, I think they're not even using hardly much uh, for swelling. You know, I, th 
It's funny. I'm, I'm actually listening to this um, this book on cancer. Thankfully, no one in my life has cancer, so I, I just read a lot. And one of the books is it's this really long book. Let me read you the title because I think it's it's a really interesting read about just medicine in general. It's called The Emperor of All Maladies. It's by uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee, and so there's just like so much interesting info about how medicine has developed, and cancer is such a difficult problem to solve, um, but we learned through icing or back in the day, we thought like, you know, you bump your head, you'd be big knot. Well, we want that to go down. So you put ice on it, it goes down. But wh why would your body swell if it didn't have some protective healing purpose? Right. And that seems to be essentially the thought today. They're like, why do we want swelling to go away when it seems like swelling brings like white blood cells in and has this sort of like bring in that beep, beep, like bring in the construction crew to clean this up. And then they go back about their merry way. So, you know, this thought started changing a couple of years ago where basically kind of was like, look, if you want to ice your arm, fine. It's probably not going to do it. It's not going to hurt anything probably, but you don't want to reduce blood flow. Like the blood flow is bringing in nutrients. So essentially what I would say is this, if you want to ice fine, it's probably just more of a placebo effect than anything. Um, if you don't want to ice, that's, probably fine too. I'd never really iced. If my arm really, really hurt, and sometimes it did, sometimes I would ice it, but really I didn't ice my arm and I didn't seem any worse for wear. Um, now heat, I don't know about that. I know that's sort of going in that same principle. Well, if some amount of blood flow is good, heat will bring more blood flow. Does that make it better? I think the verdict is out. I'm not sure. So um, what I do know is most doctors don't really seem to recommend like doing a lot of arm care exercises after a game, which I think is a, a common thought because here's the thing you just like traumatized your arm. Essentially. That's what pitching is. And this is what my, my arm surgeon told me after one of my surgeries. I'm like, what should I do after right, right when I leave the game? Like, what's the best thing? He's like, eat potato chips. I'm like, well, what about the next day after pitching? Eat potato chips, maybe do some other exercise, but like, literally don't throw a ball. And that's what he said. He's like, look, you just traumatized your arm. You threw a hundred pitches in the game as hard as you freaking could. And you warmed up in the bullpen. Why do you need to do more exercises right as you come out of the game? Just like let your arm heal. And I think there's a lot of merit to that. And, but I don't think people want to hear that because they want to do like, what's the most diligent best thing to like speed recovery. Sometimes rest is just really good. So I don't have a great answer. I know that I think ice is probably unnecessary I think you can do it. I don't think it has any benefit. Um, I think heat, I think the verdict's out. I don't really know. Um, I think probably just like moving around a little bit, maybe like a little bit of a run, just get the blood flow in the body in general. But in general, I, I don't think you need to do a whole lot after you pitch it when you come out. So I don't have a more specific answer, but I, I don't know that we know as much as we wish we knew about exactly what to do after a game. I think a lot of it is speculation and – I, I think really that's about it. I think most of it's just speculation. Um, Dan, have I ever made to the MLB? No, I have not. I wish I had, but I have not. Um, for those of you who showed up and are on your way out, thank you. Although I know you're gone, so you didn't hear that. Um, let's see. Any other questions? I see some how often should I throw stuff. Uh, change up, throw two strikes. Um, let's see. When I throw a slider, should I fully extend my arm or throw it short to the dirt? Um, I don't exactly know what you mean, but just throw every pitch that you throw at full speed. Don't think about your arm. If you're thinking about what your arm should do when you're throwing a pitch, you're doing it wrong. You pick your pitch, you get your grip, you practice it. When you're out in the mound, you get your pitch, you come set, and then you just throw it. Don't think about it and don't consciously try to do anything about it. Um, let me see what else I got. Uh, yeah, I think the ice was a good question. I think a lot of people have that question. I think it's just if, if I think it's just trust your body. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Like, does your body need the help of ice to heal itself? I don't think it does. Um, da, 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 da. I'm not sure. I see. Let me see. Any new messages? Last call for questions. Um, okay. What? Here's a good one. What things can I use? I'll take two more questions after this one. So throw in any other ones and I'll answer. And I'll answer one more. That's just like a fun one. Um, what things can I use for arm care? I use J bands, sometimes use weighted balls. Is there anything else that I should also try and add to a routine? Um, I'm going to have a video soon. I don't know exactly when, 
Um, cause in that routine online course that I'm making that I explained, I have like my full arm care routine. One exercise that I really like is called flutters. So like, obviously you can do arm circles. Flutters are like, I'll just demonstrate one here. You just kind of go forward and back. You don't need a weight, but this is actually from an exercise called rhythmic stabilization. So if your shoulders hurt, you'll be in PT and you'll like, they'll say, don't let me move your arm. And then they'll like tap your arm in all different directions. And your goal is to keep it stable. And so you can take a one pound weight in your hand or just hold a baseball or just have your arm and just take your arm through different ranges of motion and sort of just go fast, flutter down, flutter back up. I like to do this in like a big X pattern. So I'm like going down like I'm and then like doing a reverse throw coming back up. I think those are awesome. And they make your arm like flushed with blood, just like arm circles. Like arm circles are, are pretty underrated. I know they're old school. Arm circles are great. So do your arm circles. But also do your arm circles in front too. You don't have to only do, I don't know why, you know, did this come down from the heavens? It's like a commandment that you can only do arm circles out to the side. We would do arm circles at like a 45 and a little bit in front too. Why not? But I like flutters a lot. I think this, this idea, you'll just try it once. You don't have to do a ton of them, but it really, again, gets that like stabilizing component and really pumps blood into your arms. I think those are great. Um, what else should you try? I don't think you need a tremendous amount of things to warm up properly. I still think throwing is a great warm up if you have enough time to like start slow. But arm circles, um, bent over L's, Y's, T's, um, all those are on my channel. Um, and I think the weighted ball stuff is fine. If you just want to like pound a couple into the wall, not at full speed to help warm up, I think that's totally fine. It's not really different from throwing. If you're taking a six ounce or eight ounce ball, throwing it into a brick wall at 50% effort, there's not going to be more stress on your arm than throwing a five ounce ball, 75% effort. Right. Right. So I think if you like that, that's totally fine. Obviously you've seen players on TV doing it like Raldis Chapman. Again, you, if you could throw a football, you could throw a, you know, you could throw a weighted ball. You just have to be smart about it. I just don't think going full bore is the best thing, but I think if you have a band and you have a good cocktail of body weight exercises, like arm circles, flutters, some of the bent over Y's, T's and L's that I talked about, and some way to, I think that's all you really need. You don't need to do 10 exercises to get warm. Just get some blood flow quick. Also, don't forget jumping jacks, seal jacks, cross jacks. Seal jack is when you, you clap your hand like a seal instead of like going over your head. And a cross jack is when you cross your arms. Those are good too. Oldies with goodies, calisthenics. You're just trying to get blood flow going because really the goal of warm up is to get blood flowing through your body and your arms without tiring your arm out, without like taking bullets away from your arm, right? So anything that does that is good. Old school calisthenics are fine too. You can look like a old weirdo doing some weird, like blip, 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 blip. it's totally fine. Um, body blade. Yeah, those are great. I think body, body blades are wonderful. That works on that same like rhythmic uh, principle. If you know what a, a body blade is out there, but yeah, you can make this out of a PVC pipe, super cheap, put like two tennis balls in the end. That stuff's great. Um, let's see what else. Uh, da, 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 da. So when you throw your slider, should you throw at the same speed as your fastball? Yes. Every off speed pitch you throw should always be exactly the same arm speed as your fastball hundred percent or 99%, 98%, whatever it is that you sort of like idle at every pitch is the same arm speed. If you throw your fastball 90 miles per hour, you put that same 90 mile per hour arm speed into your changeup and your cutter and your curveball and your slider and your sinker. Everything is the same speed intensity wise as your fastball. You never ease off anything. Um, I think that's about it. Any others? My favorite baseball team growing up was the Atlanta Braves. I do not have a baseball favorite baseball team now. When you get through pro ball, what happens to a lot of guys is like you're paid to play, especially like I played in the independent leagues. Um, guys who are drafted, like their teams kind of chew you up and spit you out. Like you're more like a commodity, you're more like a cattle, like a, you know, like one head of cattle than you are kind of a person. A lot of times you've all probably seen the news, how off, how awful minor league baseball conditions are. So imagine like, you know, it's like kind of like being in a relationship, like you have a you know boyfriend or girlfriend and they don't really treat you that well for a bunch of years, but you stay together and then they break up with you and you're like, I'm not like, you know, I don't feel fondly towards them. And unfortunately that's the way a lot of guys are where, yeah, you get drafted by, you know, the Joe Schmoes or you get drafted by the Atlanta Braves or the Yankees. This isn't any team in particular, but you get drafted by a team and they release you eventually. Right. At some point, that team gets rid of you. Do you go watch them on TV anymore? Nah. So 
I think most pro players, unless they had a really deep connection with the team, like they grew up in Chicago, went to the you know Cubs games or the Sox games with their dad. And unless you had a really deep allegiance to a major league team growing up, it kind of gets weeded out when you get into, into pro ball. Because again, you're like, you're part of it and you get kind of chewed up and spit out. Even if you don't feel bad about it, you feel grateful for it, which I think most of us do. You still just like, don't really, you just have a different perspective on it is what I would say, which I think is understandable. Um, but I think that's going to be it guys. I, I really appreciate the comments. Um, I would like to do another one of these. I don't want to commit to them like every month or whatever, but I, I, I like being on able to interact with all of you. Um, like I said, I really appreciate everyone's, uh, just watching the videos, commenting, sharing them, you know, this, it means a lot to me because, you know, maybe, you know, my story, maybe you don't, I won't go too into depth, but you know, I had a hard road through baseball. I'm really appreciative of all of it. I'm really grateful, which is a lot of that's in my new book. Um, and in my memoir, which is called Dear Baseball Gods. But, you know, like I love the game and I want to give back. And you all have given me the, the platform to do that. And I appreciate that because a lot of people try to do YouTube. And I recommend a lot of people who I know a lot of people who are smart that have, you know, they're a, a, a subject matter expert on this or that. And I encourage them. And I have a friend who's a real estate agent. Make a YouTube channel. Like you could share all your knowledge. Like it's hard. It's a lot of work. It's a long grind. You've probably seen my videos evolve. If you watch a video from even a year ago, you know, the, I don't have the fancy $500 microphone and um, expensive camera and all this stuff. And I put a lot of effort trying to make my videos sound really good and look really good and be as descriptive and, and helpful as I can. That's why I have like two different views for a lot of new videos. And I've learned a lot along the way. And if people weren't watching, I wouldn't have been incentivized to get better and to, to, to do all that and to put all this effort into them. So, um, you know, you guys have pushed me by saying, yeah, we're going to watch, even if your video is not great today, we're going to keep watching so that, you know, you feel valued, which I do. And then here's more of you showing up to, you know, to this live stream. It's hour, an hour and a half in, and there's still a couple dozen people here. So like I said, I appreciate this and I hope my videos have been helpful. If you have suggestions, leave them in the comments. I respond to a lot of them. Sometimes a little harsh, I know. Um, but I'm also, I don't mince words sometimes. Um, and really I don't participate in social media really expect, except for YouTube. So, um, Twitter is a cesspool, unfortunately, and I try to keep my life balanced. So I try to go out there, film, do a, you know, give a good piece of knowledge to you all, host it and be on my way and kind of get back to, like I said, some of my, my writing projects and, uh, hopefully more baseball clinics and speaking gigs in the future. Cause that's another thing I'm, I'm passionate about. So thank you again. Um, there will be another live stream. So if you want to stay up to date, definitely subscribe to the channel. I'll post about it like I did today and my email list. I always blast out every new video and every new thing that comes out. So yeah, appreciate everyone. Have a great night and we'll see you here. On